Tarkreed. First, the rain turned black. Then the desert grew a skin. When Iraqi troops torched Kuwait's oil fields as they retreated during the Gulf War in 1991, the sky behaved like a furnace hood. Smoke climbed in pillars, fused into an artificial night, and fell back to Earth in oily drizzle. NASA's Landsat satellite caught the crime in progress. Ten months of burning, hundreds of wells howling, plume was big enough to redraw the weather. And when that black rain hit sand and gravel, it hardened into a mysterious new material, something no geologist had ever seen before. They called it Tarkrete. Tarkrete spread as a literal dark continent, a wartime geology. Field teams measured it up to four inches thick, mapped almost a thousand square kilometers at peak, nearly 5% of Kuwait. Under that black shell sat more than 300 inland oil lakes, slick, shifting basins that swallowed birds and reflected the sun like shattered obsidian. The figures defy comprehension. More than 600 wells ablaze, one to 1.5 billion barrels of oil released. 25 to 40 million barrels left unburned across the dunes. Fighting the fires was called Operation Desert Hell. Bulldozers wore heat shields. Seawater was pumped through reversed oil pipelines to douse the infernos. When hoses failed, Hungarian crews mounted MiG-21 jet engines on Soviet tanks, an improvised monster called Big Wind, to blast the flames into submission. By November 1991, the last well went quiet. But the ground was forever changed. At first, Kuwait planned to destroy the Tarkrete with machines nicknamed Camel Pitters and reseed the desert. Then came a twist no one expected. When researchers lifted the edge of the scab, they found a surprise. Below the Tarkrete, the soil read clean. The volatile poisons had baked off. What remained in the crust were heavy, inert hydrocarbons. The black armor behaved like a garden's mulch and a solar panel. It soaked up sunlight, warming the upper soil by three to four degrees Celsius. It trapped rare rain, boosting moisture by more than 60% and holding it into the hottest summer months. Seeds took hold. In the places where the tarcrete lay moderately cracked, vegetation cover ran up to 8% higher than on open sand. The recommendation from some scientists, leave it alone. The war's scab had become a sanctuary. To scrape it away would destroy the accidental ecosystem it created. Today, Tarkrete remains a permanent feature of Kuwait, a living scar, visible from space, equal parts horror and wonder. Stand in the desert and touch its brittle black surface, and you can feel both stories at once. The roar of man-made apocalypse, and the quieter roots of persistence and survival pressing upward. The Devil's Cigarette Lighter In February 1962, as astronaut John Glenn soared over Africa aboard Friendship 7, a strange glow caught his eye. In the emptiness of the Algerian Sahara, something burned so bright it pierced the void of space. A column of fire roared louder than a fleet of jet engines and reached 800 feet into the sky. Glenn wasn't looking at a missile launch or a nuclear test. He was witnessing what would become known as the Devil's Cigarette Lighter and it wasn't going out any time soon. The blaze had erupted months earlier, on November 6, 1961, when static electricity sparked a rupture at well GT2 in the Gassi Tuil gas field. The earth screamed as 6,000 cubic feet of natural gas per second ignited, melting desert sand into glass. By day, it shimmered through heat haze. By night, it became a hellish lighthouse, visible from 100 miles away on the ground. If left unchecked, engineers warned it could burn for a century. The companies that owned the well, French firms Copefa and Omnirex, and the US-based Phillips Petroleum, watched helplessly 
as one of the largest underground gas reserves on Earth went up in smoke. It was losing half a billion cubic feet a day, enough to fuel a city the size of Paris for three months. So they call it the Devil's Equal, Red Adair, a swaggering Texan with flame-colored hair, a taste for red Cadillacs and nerves of steel. A protege of Myron Kinley, the man who first learned to blow out well fires with dynamite. Adair had already tamed hundreds of oil field infernos. His secret was the Monroe Effect, a discovery from the world of weapons. By shaping explosives into a hollow charge, you could channel the blast into a focused jet of energy. It was the same principle that let bazookas punch through tank armor. And paradoxically, the same principle that could snuff out a fire by blasting away its oxygen. Still, the devil's cigarette lighter was unlike anything Adair had faced. Adair and his team, Boots Hansen, Coots Matthews, and Charlie Toller, spent five months just preparing the battlefield. Under a constant rain of sparks, they bulldozed wreckage, dug massive reservoirs, and drilled for water that could be used to fight the blistering heat. The fire had become so intense that even approaching it required bulldozers with steel protective shields, cooling water curtains from high-pressure hoses, and backup helicopters on standby in case someone combusted. On April 28, 1962, the moment came. Adair mounted a modified bulldozer. On its 66-foot boom hung a steel drum packed with 550 pounds of specially shaped nitroglycerin. He inched forward through the wall of heat. Medical teams waited, prepared to scrape him off the sand if anything went wrong. When the charge was released and detonated, the desert went silent. The fire that had raged for 173 days collapsed in an instant. Two days of flooding cooled the well. Four more capped it with drilling mud, where once a pillar of flame clawed the sky, there was only smoke, mud, and silence. The world celebrated Adair as a hero. John Wayne would later base an entire film, Hellfighters, on his exploits. Yet even decades later, the image lingers. A torch in the Sahara so bright it caught the eye of an astronaut in space. A fire so fierce it seemed less like an industrial accident and more like a warning. That beneath our feet, Earth hides powers we cannot fully control. The Fire Nados. At first, it seemed like the end of the world. At 7.35 a.m. on April 7th, 1926, the sleepy town of San Luis Obispo, California, was jolted awake by a deafening blast so powerful it shattered storefront windows and rattled homes off their foundations. Hundreds of panicked residents poured into the streets, convinced an earthquake had struck. This disaster was far stranger and far more terrifying. Two miles south, lightning had struck the Union Oil Company's massive oil tank farm, at the time the largest in the world, lighting nearly six million barrels of crude oil. An oil worker described watching two eerie balls of lightning arc from a stormy sky, striking the steel reservoir simultaneously. Flames surged a thousand feet into the air, devouring steel, concrete, and iron fittings at over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. But the inferno itself would soon become the least of their fears. As the flames raged, something unimaginable formed over the burning tanks. Hundreds of bizarre whirlwinds began spinning up from the fire, many taking on monstrous, tornado-like shapes. Witnesses stood frozen in horror as fiery funnels emerged from dense smoke clouds, some just a foot wide, spiraling furiously with deafening roars. These weren't ordinary twisters. The violent heat spawned something rarer. Modern meteorologists classify them as fire whirls. Unstable cousins of tornadoes that can spin at 120 miles per hour composed entirely of flame, ash, and searing debris. Within minutes, one of these fiery vortexes peeled away from the inferno, hurtling toward the nearby Seaver Cottage. The whirlwind effortlessly lifted the house from its foundation, carrying it 150 feet through the air before smashing it into a nearby field. 
two men inside, the father and son, never stood a chance. Survivors described the terrifying sight of these fire tornadoes as almost supernatural. One man fleeing the chaos glanced back to see a small wooden shed spinning impossibly, hundreds of feet above the ground inside a funnel of flame. Another twister rammed a 16-foot wooden beam through a thick plank wall like a giant spear. For five relentless days, San Luis Obispo became a surreal nightmare. Residents describe a ceaseless roar, punctuated by chilling explosions each time tanks boiled over, exploding and spilling blazing oil across nearly 900 acres. Engineers calculated that the tornadoes hurled burning debris and molten metal up to three miles away, setting distant orchards ablaze and scattering ash and twisted wreckage across the valley. Meteorologists later puzzled over the sheer ferocity of these phenomena, recognizing them as some of the most powerful fire tornadoes ever documented. Some funnels spun clockwise, others counterclockwise, their vortices defying logic and gravity. Photographs captured during the event show ghostly funnels suspended like black ropes against the smoke, though eyewitnesses insisted the tornadoes themselves appeared white-hot, writhing like angry serpents. When the flames finally died out, nearly $275 million of property in today's money lay destroyed. Two lives were lost, and an entire community was forever haunted by the nightmarish image of fiery twisters dancing through the dark sky. The Lakeview Gusher It looked like the Earth itself had been wounded. On a March morning in 1910, the hills above California's San Joaquin Valley split open, and oil came screaming out of the ground with the force of a volcano. Witnesses swore they could hear it roar from miles away, a black geyser 200 feet high, taller than the surrounding hills, twisting into the sky like a column of smoke from hell. The smell was suffocating, the sound was endless, and as one observer wrote, quote, it's hell, literally hell. It roars and rips like hell. It smells and terrifies like hell. It is as uncontrollable as hell. The Lake View Gusher had arrived. What began as a promising drill hole in Kern County instantly became the largest accidental oil spill in human history. Bigger than the Deepwater Horizon disaster, it was a monster no one could stop. At its peak, the Lake View Gusher spewed more than 125 barrels a day. Five million gallons, an unstoppable artery cut deep into the earth. For 544 days, the earth bled black. The numbers are staggering. Nine million barrels in all. More than half of it, hundreds of millions of gallons, lost forever, evaporating in the valley heat or seeping back into the soil. The deluge was so vast that it created an oil lake a black inland sea, large enough for workers to raft across. And yet this was no fortune. It was a curse. So much oil flooded the markets, the crude prices collapsed by half. Tank farms overflowed, pipelines burst, and farmers downstream prayed the tide would not reach Lake Buena Vista, their only source of irrigation water. The gusher swallowed machinery whole, a timber box the size of a house was lowered over the crater in a desperate attempt to contain the well. But the torrent shredded it to pieces. Eventually, even the derrick collapsed and vanished into a sand-choked pit. At night, the sky glowed with reflected moonlight off rivers of oil, and preachers warned of an earth-drowning apocalypse. The oil mist carried on the wind for miles, clinging to skin and clothing. Tourists poured in, on special trains to gawk at the living fountain. On windy days, spectators left, dripping with crude. But fear hung over the place. A nearby well, Tightwad Hill, caught fire, the flames so bright they lit up the valley. The Lakeview Oil Lake never burned, but men labored under the constant terror it might. A single spark, a stray match, was all that was missing. Eighteen months later, the gusher finally died, not because humans conquered it, but because the earth caved in, swallowing its own wound. 
By then, the land was scarred with black ponds, sandbag dikes, and stratified layers of congealed oil. Fossilized rivers of crude, still visible today. The Lakeview Gusher is remembered as an industrial accident, but there's something uncanny about it, too. An eruption that seemed less like geology and more like possession. For 18 months, the valley belonged not to men, but to the earth itself, raging until it had nothing left to give. The Oil Pit Squids In late 1996, workers at General Motors Plant 9 in Anderson, Indiana, pulled a strange organic shape from the black sludge of an oil pit. Six to eight inches long, earthworm-colored, with little tentacles that moved as if tasting the air. It was something alive where nothing should live. They called them oil pit squids. Anderson was already a ghost town in the making. Once a boom town of the Midwest, the city had hitched itself to the industrial empire of General Motors. At its peak, GM employed 23,000 of the town's 70,000 residents. After GM spun off Delphi in 1999, operations dwindled, leaving behind rust, debt, and a toxic footprint. But two years earlier, it left behind something else. Something alive. Workers at Plant 9 said there wasn't just one creature in the sludge pit, but several. Transparent, writhing things that looked like squid or worms, only thicker, stranger. A 30-year plant veteran described it as having, quote, tentacles and possibly eyes. Against every law of biology, it swam in a slurry of oil, stripper, antifreeze, and polyol, a chemical soup used to make plastic bumpers. One specimen was hauled out, killed, and placed in a jar. The jar sat in a corner of the plant for days, a kind of sideshow attraction for bored employees on lunch break. But then the jar disappeared. When the local paper broke the story in March 1997, it made the front page. The Indiana Department of Environmental Management confirmed in a leaked memo that GM workers had indeed found, quote, a creature of unknown origin or type. Even the EPA admitted they had, quote, never run across anything like this before. For once, government officials seemed just as curious as the public. Delphi, the GM subsidiary that ran Plant 9, scrambled for an explanation. Company spokespeople insisted the creatures were nothing more than a colony of harmless bacteria, the kind that grows when organic matter meets fresh water. But why, workers asked, did harmless bacteria need eyes? The mystery spread when a national tabloid picked it up under the headline, It Came From Plant 9. An artist rendering showed a nightmare squid crawling from the toxic sludge. Copies of the paper sold out instantly across Anderson. The town that once prided itself on cars now had a new claim to fame. A monster. But when investigators returned to the pit, they found nothing. The sludge had been drained. The creatures, if they ever existed, were gone. Were they alien spores, carried in on the wind and mutated in the oil? Were they worms, twisted by decades of chemical runoff? Or were they just shadows, the industrial Midwest projecting its anxieties onto a jar of sludge? The pit was demolished. Plant 9 is gone. But in Anderson, stories of the oil pit squid survive. A reminder that sometimes, even in a dying factory town, the strangest thing isn't the collapse of industry. It's what crawls out of the ruins. Which of these oil mysteries was the most horrifying? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.